Father God, we thank you, Lord, once again for your faithfulness, for your goodness, Lord, and that we can come together and worship you as your people. Father, would you fill us with your spirit and accept this time of worship. May these songs that we sing, Lord, be about you and that you will receive all the glory and praise. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you that we're able to meet. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus who died on the cross. Lord, so we want to lift this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let us rise and worship the Lord. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man and praise, the treasure that they are never enough. Then you came along, put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied.
no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I am a child. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us once again to worship you and to praise your name. Lord, as we just sang, uh, Lord, we know that fear doesn't come from you and that your love drives out fear. Lord, Father God, let that be prevalent in our lives. Um, help us to live our lives uh, boldly and courageously. Uh, for the furthering of your kingdom. We pray for those that aren't able to make it today, a lot of people traveling due to vacation. Please be with them in safety, uh, especially Pastor Derek and family as well. And um, we just pray that you may be with Pastor Josh, uh, anoint him and bless him and give him wisdom this morning to speak your words to us today and help us as a congregation just to take those words and be able to Leave this place and apply it into our lives, Lord. We thank you for all your blessings this past week. We come to you um, just, uh, just for forgiveness of our sins and uh, cleansing this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning for those on virtual land as well. It must be spring break because a lot of people are missing. And uh, definitely, like, I don't see any kids today. <laughs> Very few kids this morning, so I understand a lot of people are out on vacation. Um, just a few announcements this morning. So, baptism class. The, our hope is that we can baptize someone during uh, Easter. So, if you haven't been baptized, or you you know you you rem you remember, or you, you're told that you were infant baptized, but you haven't had an adult baptism, if you want to reconfirm through baptism, please uh, see Pastor Derek because he will hold a baptism class in preparation for that Easter service. This is something new. It's not on your bulletin, but it's uh, we want to do, in lieu of the annual picture that we take during Easter, we want to do a collage this year. Probably not a good thing to gather real tightly together for a photo shoot. So if you can, um, find your best family photo and submit it to the church account. You should see an email uh, proactively calling for the pictures in the coming week or so. So, yes, look for your best family photo, and we want to create a collage that we can um, kind of display social media mediums and stuff like that, okay? Uh, keep in mind, Good Friday service on April 2nd at 7 p.m., as well as Easter service on April 4th. And just a reminder to all the parents, we are officially changing the, the children's worship back to 1030 uh, versus the 930 service we have going on today. And just a couple calendar items, women's book study. The next one is April 8th, as well as there's a picnic uh, later in that month as well. And then the youth group also has their fun game day at the tail end of March. That should be on the bulletin as well. Okay? Uh, at this time, let me turn it over to Pastor Josh, who's guest speaking for us today. Let's welcome with a warm round of applause. Good morning, guys. I'm going to take this off. Whew. Whew. All that lights. Well, it is good to be in God's house. Amen. I mean, uh, yes, this is a school, and we are renting from it, but where God's people are gathered, that's where God's church is, right? All right. Um, all right, let me go ahead and grab my, <coughs> my stuff here. It's finally good to meet you all in person. Yes, I do exist. I know some of you guys were like, did, I, did, we, or, did, we, you know, did we hire a youth pastor? Where, where is he? I, I'm here. It's just uh, <laughs> my schedule is a little bit different. But it is finally good to meet you guys all in person. Um, I, I was a youth pastor at my previous uh, church as a youth pastor in, in the Chinese church, but I'm also a missionary currently right now raising financial support because my goal and my desire and really my passion is to plant churches abroad and train up leaders full-time in the Philippines. 
And um, so in order to get an idea of like where my passions are, you know, and, and, and how, I, how I minister to the youth and how I, how I want to be able to part, be part of this church, um, I'll give you guys a little bit of background. So I was, I was saved in college through my roommate, okay? I was going to ASU at the time, and I was studying electrical engineering, actually. You know, I, I didn't, you know, when you graduate from high school, who really knows really what they want to do, right? And so my dad was an electrical engineer, and I figured the money must be good. Becoming an engineer must make good money. So I figured, why not? I'll go into engineering and get a good job, right? Makes a lot of money. And it was in college where I, I started hearing a lot of different things about the Lord. I, I grew up believing in God, but um, I didn't really know too much about him. And I had a lot of questions about who God was. I had a lot of doubts about who God was. And, you know, in college, there's a bunch of different ideas and there's a bunch of different things being thrown out there. And so I, I, one of the things I thought was, like, who do I listen to? Who has the authority on what they can properly say about who God is? Like, do I listen to the priest? Do I listen to the, the pastor? Do I listen to the, the monk or the imam, right? Do I listen to the scientist, the humanist, the atheist? Or maybe just kind of everybody just listens to their own gut instincts, right? Their own hearts. So who, who, how do I know who God is? Who do I listen to? So I thought, and my youth know this because we talked about this during our Bible study. I said, you know, if, if God is real, let him speak for himself. Let him speak for himself. Because, it, you know, if God isn't real, I don't want to really waste my time with prayer if, there's, if God doesn't exist, if God is not real. And so I, I remember I got down on my knees and I said, Lord or God or whoever you are, let me know that you're out there. And here's a scary thing. He answered, right? He answered. And, um, you know, so my next question was, okay, tell me who you are, by what name I should call you. And he said, if you want to get to know me, get to know my son, you know? And so I, I, after that, I had, a, I had a lot of more questions. I had a lot more doubts. I had, what about this? What about this? I started reading a little bit of the Bible. And uh, it was amazing because within the span of a few months, God kept answering my doubts. God kept answering my questions until I literally was out without any excuse, you know, I w it wasn't until later that I found out that that was actually what we call the witness of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, my second year of college, I got down on my knees and I placed my faith in Jesus. And uh, at that time, you know, I started going to church with my roommate on Sundays and I started getting involved in the college ministry. I started getting involved in small groups. And, um, you know, th those, those ministries are what really helped me to grow spiritually. You know, um, the leaders actually did a good job. Of, they started to disciple me. They didn't just, you know, let's just have Bible studies. They actually, they actually discipled me. I remember they were one time because they found out I played guitar. I said, let's, one, the small group leader said, what do you think about joining me in, in, in playing the guitar for, for worship during our small group? And I said, okay. And before you know it, I'm leading worship in the small group. And before you know it, I'm leading small group a couple of years later. And so the church and the ministry and the small groups really contributed to my spiritual growth. And, you know, I felt the call, I felt the burden for missions when I came back from my first trip to the Philippines. After I graduated ASU and I started working, making a lot of money, I, I might add, <laughs> um, I started growing complacent in my faith. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I have been growing in my, my knowledge of Jesus. I've been going to church. I've been going to small group. But it's just, it's all accumulating up here. I wasn't really growing in my relationship. And then a missionary came to our church one time, and one, one, uh, one night, and he said, um, you got to go to the Philippines you got to see what God is doing there. God is doing some amazing things, right? Come out for a couple weeks. And, you know, I, I, thought, I thought this was a good chance to get outside my comfort zone. You know, for me, I didn't really think, oh, yeah, I want to go out and I want to I preach the gospel. In the four years that I had gotten saved from, from college up to, you know, the time I'm working, I, I had never shared the gospel with anyone. My whole life, I've never been, I've never even been outside the country. And so I wasn't thinking, yeah, let's go out and let's evangelize. I was thinking, this would be a good adventure. You know, I, I was new to evangelism. I was new to this country. And when I went over to the Philippines, God really just blew my mind away. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you ever want to experience God, not just know about him, but if you want to experience God, you know, experience his power, experience his provision, if you want to experience answer to actual answer to prayer, get outside your comfort zone because that's where you meet God. That's where you stop depending on yourself and that's where you need someone to depend on. 
And that's where, and when I went to the Philippines, I mean, I had no idea what I was doing. I've never shared the gospel. For those of you who don't really know me, I'm a, I'm a very, I'm very much an introvert. So even coming up here and, and, sh- and preaching the gospel in public is super, super nervous for me. Um, but I got to experience God's power through that. You know, we shared the gospel with, with high school and with, um, with college students. We got to see, like, we would actually go into the public schools, go into the classrooms and give a 15 minute presentation on the gospel. And during those times, I mean, we would go in, we would preach. After we would come out, we would go to the next room, go to the next room. And as soon as we were done, we would load up our van and our team would drive off to the next school. We would do that every single day for, 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 you know, for the weekday. And then on the weekends, we would travel to the next island and do the same thing over and over again. Right? And we saw, th- we saw people's lives transformed. We saw people moved with the Holy Spirit conviction. I, I, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, you see hope literally fill people's eyes. Like the look on their face when you're sharing the gospel and all of a sudden they, like the lights click. They, they get it. They understand that God is not a religion. God is a person that we can have a relationship with. Right? And it's, it's, it's just an amazing thing. Like when I walk, well, after I share that 15 minute gospel and I walk out that door, right? Just knowing that there are people going to heaven because of that gospel. Right? Sometimes I tell the students, that I said, look, you didn't expect me, you know, and, and all of a sudden this is God's calling for you. Right? By the, when you walked into this door, you were on your way to hell. And by the, time you, by the time you leave, if you place your faith in Jesus, you're on your way to heaven. Like, that, that just blows my mind. And what happened was, as I started preaching the gospel and started really interacting with these young people, <clears throat> I started to develop a compassion for people that I, you know, I honestly <laughs> didn't really have. You know, I saw people the way God sees people. And nothing compares to that. Nothing compares to that. And you know, when I returned from that trip, it was, it was like, how can how can I return to a nine to five job in my cubicle again? You know, like it was so meaning and satisfying. And the Lord was really burdening my heart. I mean, I literally preached to thousands of people. In in a span of a couple weeks, I I preached to maybe tens tens of thousands of kids. And I saw thousands more respond to this life-giving gospel. I saw thousands more place their faith in Jesus. And when I came back from that trip, God really gave me a burden to do this full time. And so, you know, eventually I talked to my mentors and I I was praying about it, thinking about it. And, um, you know, ultimately I, I left my engineering job. I started seminary. I obtained my seminary degree and I started working as a youth pastor at a Chinese church. And that's actually where I met, um, you know, Pastor Derek, right? This is, these are some of my youth in my old, younger days, right? Now, here's the thing that bothered me. When I became a born-again believer, I actually got a lot of persecution from my parents, right? I grew up in a Catholic household, and, you know, when I told them that I, I've placed my faith in Jesus, that I'm a Christian, you know, I got a lot of backlash. They were telling me, you know, I had abandoned my religion. I had abandoned my traditions. You know, I think the word brainwashed was used a couple times. I mean, it was hurtful. And really, it was my church family that helped me through this time, you know, encouraging, to, to gr- encouraging me to grow in my faith. And that's really where I learned, you know, the importance of church. Because the church is not just an organization or a Sunday gathering. It's really a family, you know, and my question, the thing that bothered me was, what about those Filipinos? What about the people in the Philippines? We preach the gospel and they accept the gospel. What happens to those young people who place their faith in Jesus? Who would encourage them? You know, who would disciple them? Who would, you know, who would teach them to love God's word? And so for me, this is why, this is where my passion is, right? This is why church planting for me is a top priority for me as a missionary. Because even, even, even in the Philippines, a lot of people have heard the name of Jesus, but they have no clue who he really is. You know, and I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's some of you here today, maybe sitting here or online. I mean, maybe you've, maybe you've grown up in church a lot and you, you've heard all the things, all the facts about Jesus. You, you know the lingo by heart and you can recite it, but it hasn't really impacted your life, impacted your heart. It hasn't really transformed you. You guys, I can't, Honestly, I can't imagine where I'd be without the support of my home church family. I'm, I'm, for those of you who can agree, you understand, right? I don't know where I would be spiritually without the support of my church family. See, the Lord was really gracious enough to put me in a church that does not just feed me God's word, 
but it teaches me how to feed myself with God's word. And while I was over there in the Philippines, this is what I saw. I saw, I'll I'll call them like three great disconnects, right? The first disconnect is the inability to connect Christ with people's lives, right? Over there, it's all about religion. It's not about relationships, right? And so the great deception is if you do good, right? If you live a good life, a moral life, then God will love you, right? There's the inability to connect Christ with the churches, Right? One of the things that you see in the Philippines is there's a lot of false teachings about Jesus. There's a lot, you, you hear a lot of really wacky things about Jesus, about that, you know, Jesus was the brother of Satan, right? that Jesus was not really the son of God, that Jesus had a wife. I mean, all these, all these crazy things. So the, and, and, but the things that, these, 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 these false truths, these lies are being taught in churches that are very rich. Right? So the deception is, look at our church. Our church has a lot of people. Our church is very big. Our church looks greater than some of the, some of the other churches out there. And so we're, we must be alive. We must be successful. God must be blessing us because we're doing good. Right? That's the great deception over there. Yeah, you may, you may have a lot of, your church may have a lot of members and a lot of money. But if it's not teaching truth, Jesus is not in your church. The last disconnect that I saw was the, dis, the inability to connect people with the churches. Right? Because these churches are filled with false teachings, there is no Christ in these churches. The, the church is, is kind of insignificant. Right? So the great deception here is a church is a, church is a place that you go to to listen to the pastor. Right? You, listen, you go, you listen to him preach, rather than a community where members come to grow in their relationship together and to be trained together for the ministry. Right? Another thing I saw there was people, people in the Philippines, I love it. People are so open to the gospel, especially, especially young people. It's so exciting. There's a hunger. There, I mean, there's a hunger for something real, something authentic. They're realizing that all their religious traditions are, are empty. You know, I'm going to tell you a story that I, I, I remember we, we, I walked into a class. I thought it was going to be a normal class. I've done this, I've done this many, many times before. And, you know, I, I have my gospel down, so I, <laughs> I come in. And usually when I start off with, a, with a present, presenting the gospel, I ask a question. I said, you know, if you were to die today, are you absolutely 100% sure that you're going to heaven? Right? And they kind of sit there and they think, right? And then, you know, uh, and I tell them, you know, like, this is an actually an important message because you don't know when you're going to die. Right? Heaven forbid you die tomorrow. But if you were to die, are you absolutely certain? Right? And then they're you know, they get a bunch of different things. No, no one's ever certain. Only God knows. And uh, something happened that had never happened before. A girl in the back of the class raised her hand. She says, I know exactly when I'm going to die because I plan on killing myself. You know, uh, uh, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm, what do I say? I'm dumbfounded. I'm like, oh, I'm in panic mode now. Like, how do I respond to this? Because everybody's, at this point, everybody's looking at me, right? And I said, um well, why do you plan on killing yourself? She's like, well, life is hard. And what's the point? I mean, what, what's the point? You know, I thought about it. I'm like, Holy Spirit, give me the words right now. What do, I, what do I say? And so I said, you know, I thought about it and I prayed about it. And then I just, I started saying, I said, you know, if, if that's how you feel, maybe, you know, maybe you should probably talk to someone. But I want you to, I want you to think of it this way. Think about the fact that you're right. In fact, you're, you're probably smarter than anybody in this class. You know, everybody in this class is going to grow up. They're going to get their education. They're going to try to make a lot of money, and they're going to try to fill their lives with all of this stuff. But you figured it out early that it doesn't matter how much you fill your, that hole inside you. It's, it's not going to matter. Life is pointless, and life is hard without God, right? Without God. You know, in fact, there's a, there's a wise man in the Bible. He wrote an entire book of the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes, where he talks about how everything in life is basically meaningless without lo- the Lord. And, you know, at that point, like, I, I, noticed, I noticed that every, all, the, all the eyes were, like, turned on me, and they were, they were so engaged. Because at that moment, I wasn't really, I wasn't preaching to them. I was connecting them with the person of Jesus, and that's part of my passion. See, my, part of my passion is to cultivate that same passion for Jesus in that younger generation of people. You know, if there's one thing that the Chinese church taught me is that young people have so much potential, so much potential. And one of the things I want to be able to do as a youth pastor, even here in the church, 
is to provide that same opportunity for people to go on short-term missions. The way that missionary a long, long time ago came to our church and said, hey, you got to come to the Philippines and see what God's doing. Because I'm going to tell you something. Going on missions can be dangerous. Because it, not because of the, of the diseases and the riots and all the, you know, like not because of the physical danger. Missions can be dangerous because it can change your life. It can change your perspective on on, on ministry. It can change your perspective on God because when you're in the mission field, you see for yourself firsthand how God works. And that's my passion. And, and I don't want to just go out there, but I want to I bring that passion to other people. I want to bring that opportunity to other people. <clears throat> and so those are really my three areas that I plan to focus on in my ministry. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you don't really see me so much on Sundays because I'm out traveling trying to raise support uh, monthly support so that I can be full time training up leaders and planting churches. Um, so you know I'm, I'm training up the leaders in the local in the local churches. I'm I'm training some of the, the the people up through Zoom. I'm developing a leadership curriculum. I'm learning the language. I'm doing all of these things. So um, you know that if you don't really see me so much on, on Sundays, that that may be why. But uh, um, you know I will be traveling and I will be presenting. And COVID has kind of made things a little tricky. But I'm trusting in the Lord's timing. I'm trusting in his provision and his protection. And, uh, you know, God never sends you in a place without first preparing you. Right? So if you go, if, you, if the Lord is calling you somewhere, it doesn't matter where, and you're like, well, I, I'm not really, I don't have the tools. I'm, I, don't have the, I don't have the skill. I don't have the personality. I don't have the training. I don't have the knowledge. God will be with you. Right? God never sends you somewhere without first preparing you for it. Right? And if you, have, so if you have more questions, whether here or online, you know, feel free to stick around or, or t- drop me a text or call afterwards. Um, but this morning, I'd like to shift focus and let's get into God's Word. So if you have your Bibles with me, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible, we'll have the, uh, the verses on the screen. And we'll be, we will be reading verses 17 through 21. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 to 21. I'll be reading from the, uh, the NIV, right? So I'll go ahead and read, and if you want, you can follow along. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That, w- that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. And so we implore you on, be- on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might be become the righteousness of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you for just the opportunity to be here, Lord. I thank you for technology that even those who can't be here can still be here online virtually, Lord. And Lord, I just pray now that you empty me of myself. Take away any preparation, any nervousness, any pride or whatever, Lord, and just use me as a vessel to speak your truth, Lord. And I pray for, I pray for us this morning, whether... Uh, we're here or online, I pray that you open our minds and open our hearts, Lord, to be receptive to your truth. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that your truth does not just in, inform us, but transform us, Lord, because that is a work that I cannot do, Lord. No matter how many, much preparation, no matter how many good illustrations I use, it's not me and my words that change a lot of people's lives. It's your spirit. And so I pray that you would do that this morning. Help us to be sensitive to your truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, this morning, I want to ask a question, right? <clears throat> are you an ambassador for Christ, or are you a more like a Christian tourist? Right? Think about that. I mean, that's a, that's a, that in itself is a pretty convicting question, if you think about it. What, what's the difference between a tourist and an ambassador? Right? What is the difference? Right? A tourist is someone who leaves his home, to go explore, right? They, I mean, some of you guys are like that right now. You're on vacation, being coming tourists, going to different places, exploring different things, experiencing different places and different cultures. And what's the goal of a tourist? The goal of a tourist is, you know, to relax, to immerse himself in the different culture. 
But what about an ambassador? An ambassador is also someone who leaves home, right? But what he does is he represents his culture in another place, right? His goal is not really to relax, but to proclaim, to negotiate, to represent. Ultimately, his desire really is to to return home, right? Where a tourist travels for pleasure, an ambassador travels on behalf of, of a sovereign power, Right? And we just read in Paul's letter that we are ambassadors for Christ. Right? Why does he say that? What's going on in this passage? Well, you have to understand that when, when Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, right, he wanted to write to the church to encourage them to be united, not just in the church, not let's just, let's just be all together and, and united together, but united in the work together. Because a lot of times there were these false teachers that would come into the church and, and, and come into people's lives, and they were undermining Paul's messages. They were undermining Paul's work. You know, people were turning away from God and going back to their, their pagan worship. They were getting too comfortable in, in their own lives, in their own homes. And so Paul is reminding us here how important it is to see ourselves. Where He's reminding us, he's saying, hey, look, guys, we're foreigners representing God. We're not permanent residents of this temporary world. So this morning, I want to look at what, is it, what does an ambassador for Christ look like? What does an ambassador for Christ look like? Right. First of all, it is someone who belongs to God, right? Someone who belongs to God. I mean, that's, that seems fairly obvious, right? Let me ask you, where is your citizenship? Like, your spiritual citizenship? I mean, is it, is it in heaven or is it on earth? And if you think about that, all right, if you're a believer, our citizenship is in heaven, right? And so the thing is, we can't be an ambassador from a place you don't belong, right? That that just makes sense. I'm not an ambassador of, of China, right? Because I'm not a citizen of China, right? And in order to be a, what what is what needs to happen in order to be a citizen, right? Either you need to be born in that place, or you need to become naturalized. Right? What is, in, in America, what does it mean to become a naturalized citizen? Right? Well, hopefully it means you know, to become educated in our history, to become educated in our culture, in our values, you know, to know and respect our laws and our constitutions, and not just know them, but accept them as your own. Right? That's what it means to become a naturalized citizen. And this is, even, this is true even with our spiritual condition as well. I actually like what the ESV translation of verse 17 says, right? He says um, here, he says, uh, you know, the new creation, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The ESV says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature, right? He is a new creature. John chapter 3, what happens? What must I do to be saved? You can, in order to be, <laughs> inherit the kingdom of God, I must be born again, Right? Verses 18 and 19, we see this awesome thing here, that, that God is the one who reconciles us to himself. It's not us. We don't come to God. God comes to us. Why? By his grace, through Christ. You see, what, is, what does that verse mean? It means this. When we accept Christ, what we're doing is we're renouncing our allegiance to sin. Right? We're renouncing our allegiance to the worldliness We're becoming reconciled, right? What does that, what's that mean, reconciled? It's the idea of being made right, right? I mean, we become citizens of God's kingdom. In other words, it's a permanent change of residence. This is not, we're not going to visit heaven. We're not visiting heaven. We're becoming a citizen of heaven, right? This is not a weekend getaway. This is, you're not part-time citizens, right? That's what happens when we accept Christ. This is a permanent thing, and it's a lasting thing. And since we are now citizens of a different place, the world that we live in right now becomes our foreign ground. That's what happens when we accept Christ. And so I want to challenge us to remind us, let's not get too comfortable in this world, in this life. You know, otherwise we'll forget where our home really is, right? See, an ambassador lives in a foreign country, and he may live there for a long time, but he never forgets where his home is. He never loses that desire to one day return home. See, a tourist knows where his home is, but he's constantly looking to get away from home, right? What about us? Are we that same way? Do we know that our citizenship is in heaven, but we, we love vacationing here on the earth, in this life, making, getting comfortable here? 
A spiritual, an ambassador for Christ is someone who belongs to God. But secondly, okay, an ambassador for Christ is someone who is a steward of God's message. What is a steward? What's a steward? I mean, steward, I mean, it, it, a steward is someone who is in charge of someone else's stuff, right? Simply put, a steward is someone who is in charge of someone else's stuff. And we know that nothing belongs to us. Even the very breath that we, we breathe, right? We were able to wake up this morning because of the grace of God. Everything belongs to God. We, we know that. But it's interesting because when we talk about stewardship, especially in the church context, when it comes to those things, most people think of only two things when it comes to stewardship, our, our time and our money, right? How are you being a steward of your time and how are you being a steward of your money, right? And then that's when they ask you to, to give more to tithing, right? <laughs> but what about the gospel, are we not also stewards of the gospel? I mean, the, the, think about it, guys. The gospel is powerful. And why is it powerful? Because it's, it's, it's a simple message, and it's a saving message. See, the beautiful thing about the gospel is we don't need to be a, a pastor, or we don't need to go to seminary to preach the gospel to others. We don't need fancy illustrations or reverse psychology or great speaking skills to tell other people about Jesus. When I went on my first mission trip, there was a, one of the, one of my friends, she was in, she was in college ministry with me. She went, to AS, she went to ASU with me. She got, she got saved a week, a, a week after, a week before we left for the Philippines, right? The missionary came and said, you got to see what's going on in the Philippines. We decided to go. And a week before she, she went to go preach the gospel, she got saved. She accepted Christ herself. Right? And when she went over there, I mean, she was just, she was sharing the gospel with other people. I mean, she had no, no formal training, but she understood the gospel. She accepted the gospel. Right? If you go back to our passage, what does it say? In verse 19, Paul says that God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Do you know the gospel? Right? Some people say, well, you know, I don't, I don't really know if I know the gospel. Do you know the gospel? Here's the thing. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. If, you, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, then you do know the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, faith comes by what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Right? That is how we, that is how we accept Jesus because we understand that message. So if you've accepted that message, then that means that Christ has entrusted that message to you. Right? Verse 19, what does it say? It says, because of Christ, God will not impute their trespasses. This is the good news. This is the good news that in verse 21 says that God has made Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God. There's the gospel in a single sentence right there. You see, the message that an ambassador brings is very important. Right? Not because of the words that are spoken but because of the authority behind those words that's spoken, right? Think about it. How effective would an ambassador be if he didn't, you know, like if he didn't even understand the policies of his own nation, right? How, if a messenger doesn't understand the master's motives and his plans, how can he effectively communicate that to other people, right? And in the same way, if we don't accept the gospel, if we're not transformed by it, if we don't stand as witness to its power, how can we reach others with it? See, the thing is, though, many of us have accepted the gospel. Many of us have, have placed our faith in Jesus. But we're not really doing anything with that message. What, what, are, what are we doing with that message? You see, an ambassador comes for a purpose. His purpose is to share his message with others. Right? And a spiritual ambassador becomes all things to all men in order to reach them. Right? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21. Why? Why does he become all things? To tell them the message, to show them Jesus' love. Right? See, <clears throat> oftentimes I think, I think we're so afraid of rejection. But the thing is, God doesn't hold us responsible for how people respond. We're only responsible that we convey that message. John chapter 15, verse 18, it says, if the understand, if the world hates you, if the world hates you, it hated me first. If you're going out and you're sharing the gospel and the people are not accepting you, are rejecting you, they're not rejecting you. 
They're rejecting the message. And what they're doing is they're rejecting the authority behind that message. See, a spiritual tourist doesn't want to deal with that. He's comfortable being in the world. He's comfortable being of the world. He's comfortable immersing himself in the world. And he loves to talk about the world. He loves all to talk about all the awesome things that he's seen, experienced, and done. First John chapter 2, he loves the world more than he loves God. So what, what message are you telling other people? Are you telling other people like your own message? Or are you sharing the gospel with them? And here's the thing, guys. If, if we're really effective ambassadors, we aren't just, we're not just representing Christ, okay? We're letting Christ represent himself through us, right? So an ambassador for Christ is not just someone who is a steward of God's message, but someone who reflects Christ in his or her life. Right, going back to our passage, if you look at uh, verse 20, that verb, our ambassadors, okay, we are ambassadors, that's actually a verb. That whole thing is a verb. And it's an indicative verb, meaning it's a statement of fact. Okay, in other words, God, Paul is not saying go and be ambassadors. He's saying if you've trusted in Jesus, if you accepted this message, you are ambassadors. You already are ambassadors, right? Even though I am not officially an ambassador for the United States, I do represent the U.S. when I go travel places. So if I go to France or if I go to China or wherever, okay? Why? Because I am a U.S. citizen. And so people in those different areas, they look at how I dress. They look at how I behave, what I say and what I do. And then they get a better idea of like, you know, what Americans are like, right? Maybe that's why people have such a low opinion of Americans outside the world. But here's the thing, if I start dressing and thinking and talking like everybody else, like the people in the countries that I'm visiting, I'm no longer representing the United States, right? And it's the same way in their spiritual lives, guys. People who don't know God, they look at how we act. They look at what we say. They look at what we do. And if we act and we speak like the rest of the world, then they're the rest of the world is going to think that there's no difference between heaven or hell. There's no difference between a believer and an unbeliever. There's no difference between me and you. Make no mistake, people are watching your reaction, right? They're watching your reaction to COVID. They're watching your reaction to all the th crazy things that are going on in the news, right? They're paying attention to how, how you respond to your life, even life, personal life situations. In fact, that's how my roommate brought me to Jesus. It's not because he, he constantly, you know, hammered the gospel into my head. But there was something, I noticed there was something different about the way he lived his life. He actually lived out his faith. And I noticed it because it's, it's as if no matter what the world threw at him, like it didn't, it didn't phase him. Right? He, he, there was this peace that he constantly had. There was this joy that he constantly had that, like, no matter what, even if the, you know, all the world was crashing down on him, like, it didn't phase him. And I said, what is that? What's different about you? You see, a spiritual ambassador is not just someone who tells people about Jesus, but he lives his life surrendered to Jesus so that other people can see Jesus in them. Right? Verse 20, what does it say? as though God himself was making his appeal to you. To who? Verse 19, to the world. God is trying to make his appeal to the world. And how is he doing it? He's not doing it through, you know, you know, you know thundering clouds, messages in the sky, voices in the... He's not doing it there. He's doing it through us. Verse 20, as though God himself was making his appeal to you through us. That's us. That's us as believers, people who are in Jesus. You see, we're given the ministry, the work, the service of reconciliation because we've accepted the, the message of reconciliation. Right? God is trying to reconcile himself to other people. You know, if you think very carefully about it, the most popular verse, right? I mean, John 3, 16. It stands to claim, it stands to testify that Jesus himself was an ambassador. Right, if you think about it, Jesus was the ambassador, right? We didn't, we didn't elect a, a representative of humanity to go and, you know, to God to send our, our prayers and carry our news to him. No, God is the one who took the initiative. He's the one who sent his only begotten son. He sent humanity his message of salvation. And not just the message, but the person of salvation. 
Right? In other words, Christ has become God's ambassador for us. Why? Paul says this so many times in this, in this short passage, to reconcile himself to us, to restore a broken relationship. You see, we should not be embarrassed or ashamed to tell other people the good news because it's, it's a privilege, it's not a burden, right? I mean, if the president came knocking on your door, sent you, right, I mean, and said, hey, look, I got an important message that I want you to send. I mean, we'd, we'd feel honored, right? And what message does the king of kings tell us? There's a message that I want you to tell you. I want you to tell other people, right? Think about it. We have a love that this world can't even imagine. We have a peace that this world cannot understand, We have a joy that this world cannot touch. We have a hope that this world cannot destroy. And we have the privilege of sharing that with other people. So how many of us are living as Christian tourists? Right? How many many of us really live our lives in light of eternity, knowing that our home and our treasures are stored up in heaven, not here? I mean, think about it, guys. How sad would it be to enter heaven with absolutely nothing? because we've invested our lives on things that don't last, the things that ultimately don't matter in, in, in light of eternity. So I want, to, I want us to take some time this morning and, and even this week to reflect on our spiritual citizenship. But where do you belong? You know, are you comfortable here or in this world that only lasts a little bit? You know, maybe you've caught, maybe you've got caught up in the world so focusing on the things that you've, you've forgotten where your home really is. I want to challenge you to meditate on the powerful message of life that God himself has entrusted to you. God himself has entrusted to you. What message do you bring? You know, we have the light. Are you placing that light on a light on a lampstand where people can see? Or are you hiding it under a bed, under a basket? Think about who you represent. What do, what do people see when they see you? What do people hear when they hear you? Do they see you or they, do they see Christ in you? You know, if not, maybe it's time to depend on ourselves less and depend on Jesus more. And here's the scary thing, guys. This even happens in our service in church, right? We, we serve in church, and yet, sometimes, somehow, it's, it's all about us. People see us instead of seeing Christ, right? See, when, when, when I'm describing an ambassador, it's, it's amazing how, how it parallels to being a missionary, Right to being the call of a missionary, someone who goes. Wait, what's a, what's a missionary? Someone who goes to a foreign land, someone who represents Christ, preaches the gospel. Right? A lot of people would look up to me and say, look to me and say, you know, you know, Pastor Josh, it's it's a noble thing that you're doing, going to the Philippines, and you know, I mean, leaving your home to go to a foreign country. And I remind them, like, ev- everywhere is my foreign country. The Philippines is not my mission field right now. America is also my mission field. Heaven is my home, and it's the same for us, right? Wherever you are, you are an ambassador for Christ. You are an ambassador for Christ in the city of Chandler, to the employees of, you know, fill in the blank, to your friends, to your family. So I want to challenge us today, this morning, what does it mean to be an ambassador for God? And are, are we, are, do we know where our home is? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You know, before I go to the Lord in prayer, I just want to, as, as we're bowing our heads and closing ours, I want to I wanna ask, like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're not very familiar with the message that I've been talking about this whole time. You're like, Pastor Josh, I mean, maybe I've heard the gospel, but I haven't really thought it through like, com- like completely. I haven't, really, I haven't really truly experienced or truly, truly accepted it. I still don't know parts of it, right? Or maybe you've heard the good news, but you've never really, you know, never really believed it. You've never really internalized it, or maybe you've never been actually transformed by it. And if that's, if that's you this morning, then I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you first. Lord, I just pray for, for anybody who's responding to this message, Lord. Lord, you have given us a duty, but it's not just a duty, it's an honor to to represent you. Why, Lord? I mean, look at me, I'm I'm nobody. 
I'm nobody, Lord. I'm nobody special. I'm not, a, I'm not super smart. I'm not super personable. I'm not all these things. But, but Lord, you have called me to go out and share the gospel. And you've called all of us to do the exact same thing. And so, Lord, I, I pray that you challenge and convict us this morning. If there's anybody here or online that is feeling that conviction after hearing this message, Lord, help them to understand that that's, that's you, Holy Spirit. Help them to know that they've been sitting on a, on a gold mine, that they've had the power of the gospel in their, in their, <laughs> within them all along. And all they really need to do is go out and share that with other people and see how you work in them. I don't know, maybe the, maybe the, the situation and the culture in our, in, our, in our nation makes us scared, makes us fearful, Lord. But we're just ambassadors, Lord. The message comes from you, and so the authority comes from you, and so the power comes from you. Help us to be that kind of people, Lord. And if there's anybody here who doesn't really know that gospel, Lord, who doesn't know you, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, who doesn't know what you've done for us, that beautiful message, Lord, I pray that you speak to them. I pray that you help them, um, I pray that you help them to, to, to understand the gospel, Lord. Bring someone into their lives that can share the gospel with them. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for all you've done. We thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. And so, Lord, as we, as we stand in prayer, um, I just pray for, for all of us this morning. Um, I pray that you would go with us and, and just bless us, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let me now take this time to pray silently and, and be dismissed, I guess. So thank you, guys.